Today we're going to be talking about the structure and function of the digestive system, or more commonly referred to as the anatomy and physiology of the GI tract. This GI tract, or gastrointestinal tract, is sometimes also called the alimentary canal, and it's a single hollow tube that connects our mouth, esophagus, stomach, to the small intestines, large intestines, rectum, and then finally the anus, and it carries out the digestive processes from eating to defecation. So first, it starts with the ingestion of food. And sometimes we forget that the GI tract actually does start at the mouth. It's gonna move or be responsible for the propulsion of food and waste from the mouth to the anus. We also have the function of secretion of mucus, water, and enzymes, which will break down food. We also have the mechanical digestion as long, uh, along with the chemical digestion of our food particles. But not only is it important to eat the food and put the food in our body, but there has to be a component of what actually gets absorbed. And so we have the absorption of nutrients of the digested food, and then finally the elimination of waste products. However, we don't want to forget that our digestive tract also plays a part in our immune system and provides microbial protection against infection. And we'll be getting into more detail regarding all these functions in this presentation. Now we're going to take it layer by layer and specifically tissue layers and we're going to look at it from a histological perspective in terms of what our GI tract is made of. And so if we start from the inside moving out, we start at the mucosal layer. And here you're gonna find the epithelium, the lamina propria, the muscularis mucosa. Then we move outward to the submucosa, which consists of all our glands and our ducts. Then the muscularis, and it's all in the name here. We have the circular muscle layer, followed by the longitudinal muscle layer over that. And lastly, we're at the serosa, and sometimes this is called the adventitia layer. And this has a connective tissue, and also this is where our peritoneum is located. Now these layers are concentric, meaning they're circular, and they're gonna vary in thickness depending on what sublayers are there and how many sublayers there are. But within this, there's a network of intrinsic nerves which have a responsibility. So what is that responsibility? It's going to control the mobility, the secretion, the sensation, as well as the blood flow that is located solely within our GI tract. Our GI tract is controlled by not only local stimuli, but also autonomic nervous system stimuli. We would say that this is happening through an intramural or enteric plexus, which is located in the different layers of the GI walls. Now we put food in our mouth, which is a reservoir for chewing or what we call mastication, and it mixes with our food and our saliva. And as this is happening, our taste buds are becoming activated. Imagine eating without any taste buds. There'd be no satisfaction for eating. We also, within the mouth, have 32 permanent teeth in most adults, and this is for mastication or chewing, but also it's important for speech as well. But as we're chewing and our food particles become smaller and smaller, and they start to move around our mouth, our taste buds are going to be stimulated. They are going to also cause the beginning of the breakdown of these food particles. The tongue surface, and our soft palate also have taste buds as well, and they have taste receptors. These can help us to distinguish what we're eating. Is it salty? Is it sour? Is it too sweet? Is it perhaps bitter? Or maybe it's the best of all of these things, and we have the umami tastes, the savory tastes. And this also, in addition to what we taste by our taste buds, but also the way things smell, which gets stimulated by our cranial nerve one or olfactory nerve, this is going to help to initiate more salivation. And as we initiate the salivation, we have the secretion of gastric juices as well in the stomach. 
Did you know that we secrete about one liter of saliva every single day? And it's because our three pairs of salivary glands, the submandibular, sublingual, and the parotid, secrete saliva that consists mostly of water with mucus, sodium, bicarbonate chloride, potassium, and salivary alpha amylase, which is an enzyme that initiates our carbohydrate digestion. But the composition of saliva and other gastric juices depends on the rate of secretion. Aldosterone increases the epithelial exchange of sodium for potassium, keeps that balance. So for instance, as we increase our sodium conservation, then we are releasing potassium or excreting potassium. The bicarbonate concentration of saliva is really important, and we want to sustain a pH of 7.4. The significance of the 7.4 pH is that it's going to neutralize bacterial acids and it's going to help prevent tooth decay. Additionally, we have immunoglobulin A and other antimicrobial substances, including mucin, that will help prevent infection. Remember, mucin provides lubrication. Now, both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic parts of the autonomic nervous system control salivation. Specifically, the cholinergic parasympathetic fibers, this is going to stimulate the salivary glands. But atropine, which is an anticholinergic agent, will inhibit salivation. It's keeping your mouth very dry. And that's why patients that are taking anticholinergic medications, most of the time, these are things they may be taking for incontinence. They will suffer symptoms of dry mouth because it's an anticholinergic agent. They also will complain of other symptoms like dry eyes because it's making all the mucous membranes really dry. Okay, so atropine will inhibit salivation. But the beta adrenergic stimulation from the sympathetic fibers, this is what's increasing salivary secretion. It's also important to remember that our salivary glands are not regulated by our hormones. Now that we're done chewing our food, it's time for it to move towards the esophagus. The esophagus is a hollow muscular tube that connects the oropharynx to the stomach, and in most adults, it is about 25 centimeters long. This wall of food is going to move to the stomach by a process called paracelsis, which is the coordinated sequential contraction and relaxation of both the outer longitudinal muscles and the inner circular layer of muscles. Now the pharynx in the upper third of the esophagus, this is going to contain the striated muscles, which will help with the voluntary movement. It's innervated by the skeletal motor neurons that control swallowing. Now the lower two thirds contain smooth muscles, which are part of the involuntary movement. This is innervated by the preganglionic cholinergic fibers from the vagus nerve. Do you remember in health assessment when we asked the patient to swallow and we are feeling their tracheal area. We're trying to assess for the ability for this vagus nerve to help with the process of swallowing. Now the fibers are activated in this downward sequence. It's very coordinated. It's all being controlled by the medulla, which is the swallowing center in the brain. Peristalsis is stimulated when the afferent fibers that are distributed along the esophagus start to sense that there's some type of change in the tension of the esophageal walls. But what would cause this increase in wall tension? If we put food through the esophagus, it's going to stretch. And the more food we put down, the more it needs to stretch. And so the greater the tension, the greater the intensity of this esophageal contraction. And sometimes, when we swallow too much or too fast, this contraction can be mistaken for pain that feels very similar to chest pain like angina or heartburn or dyspepsia. At each end of the esophagus, there is an opened and closed sphincter. Each of these sphincters should open and close appropriately at the right time. The upper esophageal sphincter prevents air from entering the esophagus during times of respiration when we're breathing. But the lower esophageal sphincter, sometimes called the cardiac sphincter, this is going to prevent the regurgitation of our food 
after it's moved already into the stomach. And this is important because if our food that's in our stomach starts to move back up, it's bringing along the gastric acids that were found in the stomach as well. And this could be very caustic to the esophagus. We're gonna take a deeper dive now into the voluntary and involuntary phases of swallowing. Again, remembering that this is coordinated primarily by the swallowing center. Do you remember what part of the brain that is? If you answered medulla, you're correct. So first let's talk about the voluntary phase or the oropharyngeal phase. And this takes place in less than one second. Okay, so this is what happens in that second. Food becomes segmented into a bolus by our tongue and then forced posteriorly or back towards our pharynx. And then the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx will contract so that food cannot move into the nasopharynx. It closes that area. Have you ever felt food going up into your nose? If you have, it's because the superior constrictor muscle wasn't doing a great job. At the same time, respiration is inhibited. And this occurs when the epiglottis slides down, it's preventing the food from entering the larynx and the trachea which is great that we don't have to think about that and it just does it automatically. Otherwise, we would aspirate our food into our lungs. This involuntary phase will take about five to 10 seconds and then proceeds to now the bolus of food entering the esophagus. As it starts to go down, remember we have peristalsis, so we have waves of relaxation, and then we also have the movement of the bolus of food down the esophagus. And peristalsis, which provides the sequential waves of muscular contraction, will help move that food bolus down. And it's transporting, transporting excuse me, to the lower esophageal sphincter. Remember, its job is to not let things come up from the stomach, and it also allows the bolus to move down. So at this point now, it's going to relax, and the bolus is going to move at 2 to 6 centimeters per second. It's entering the stomach now, and then the sphincter muscle knows that it needs to return to that resting tone. Now we have food in the stomach. The stomach is a hollow muscular organ, and it lies just below our diaphragm. And its job is to not only store food while we eat, but it also secretes digestive juices for digestion and mixes the food with the juices. It's gonna propel these partially digested particles called chyme into the duodenum of the small intestines. When I think about the anatomy of the stomach, I think of it in terms of real estate. So first we'll talk about the functional areas and then the boundaries. In terms of functional areas, we refer to the upper portion as the fundus, the middle portion as the body of the stomach, and then the atrium is the lower portion of the stomach. It also has major anatomic boundaries. The lower esophageal sphincter, this is where food passes through the cardiac orifice at the gastroesophageal junction and moves into the stomach. The pyloric sphincter, which relaxes as food is then moved through the pylorus, this is at the gastroduodenal junction, it will move it into the duodenum. Earlier, we took a look at the different layers of the GI tract, but now we're gonna focus in on more um, detail the muscular layers. The stomach has three layers of smooth muscle. We have an outer, a longitudinal, and a middle layer. We also have a circular layer and an inner oblique layer, which is the most prominent layer. And all of these pro become progressively thicker as we move towards the body and then even thicker as we get to the atrium. And this is where food is going to be mixed up and then pushed into the duana. The interior of the stomach is lined with a mucosa. And as the stomach empties, when there's no more food in it, then this mucosal layer kind of sits on itself and it folds up and this is called rugae, which you can see on the slide near the atrium and moving into the pylorus area. Now there are a few substances that can actually be absorbed in the stomach. And two of these things are alcohol and aspirin. And the reason they can be absorbed is because they're lipid soluble. The stomach mucosa is impermeable to water. The stomach's blood supply comes from a branch of the celiac artery. 
and it's so abundant that nearly all the arterial vessels would need to be blocked before you would notice any ischemic changes occurring in the stomach wall. And this is great because we have an ability to compensate in case there was a blocked artery leading to the stomach. We also have a series of small veins that are going to drain your blood from the stomach and move it toward the hepatic portal vein. We're going to spend some time talking about gastric motility. So in the resting state, the stomach is quite small and only contains about 50 ml of fluid. There's not a lot of tension within the walls of the stomach and the layers in the fundus, those muscle layers, they're not going to contract very much. Swallowing causes the fundus to relax, and this is called receptive relaxation. It knows when we start that swallow reflex that the stomach needs to relax so that it's able to actually receive the bolus of food from the esophagus. This relaxation is coordinated by efferent, non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic vagal fibers. It's facilitated by two polypeptide hormones, which are secreted into the GI mucosa. Do you remember what those two hormones are called? We have gastrin, and we also have cholecystokinin. Gastrin and cholecystokinin. And the actions of the digestive hormones can be further reviewed in more detail in your textbook. Now food is stored in the vertical layers. We call them the oblique layers. And as it arrives to the fundus, the food will be there and fluid will then move relatively quickly with it down to the atrium. What is the function of motilin and secretin? You're right, motilin helps with peristalsis. And think about the term motility. It's helping with the movement. Secretin actually will decrease peristalsis. And our gastric motility, or this initiation of peristaltic waves, will move through the body of the stomach toward the atrium and that rate of contraction is approximately three contractions per minute and it's influenced by the neural and hormonal activity. So gastrin along with motilin, which we now know is an intestinal hormone that increases peristalsis, as well as the vagus nerve, all increase the rate in which contraction is occurring by lowering the threshold potential of the muscle fiber. So there's less resistance. The sympathetic activity in secretin, which we know decreases peristalsis and is another intestinal hormone, are going to inhibit and raise the threshold potential. So therefore, the rate of peristalsis is going to be mediated. Well, what's it mediated by? We call them pacemaker cells. This is what's going to initiate a wave of depolarization and also what's going to help move the food from the upper part of the stomach to the pylorus. Now this mixing and emptying of chyme with the gastric juices from the stomach, it does take several hours. So when you're eating, you haven't completely digested for quite some time. But this, mis uh, this mixing will continue as it's being propelled towards the atrium. And once it approaches the pylorus, the velocity of the peristaltic wave will actually start to increase. This force helps it to move one directional. Without this force, contents would have more of a tendency to move backwards towards the stomach, which we don't want. We want it to move towards the pylorus. This retropulsion effectively will help mix the food with our digestive juices and acids, and the oscillating motion breaks down large food particles. 
And with each of these peristaltic waves, there's going to be a small portion of chyme that's going to pass through the pylorus into the duodenum. So it doesn't all happen at once. The pyloric sphincter, which is only about 1.5 centimeters long, is always open about two millimeters. It's never completely closed. However, it opens wider during contractions of the atrium. Normally, there's no regurgitation from the duodenum into the atrium unless that sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, isn't competent. We keep talking about these gastric secretions, but what really regulates it? What stimulates it? The stomach is going to secrete large volumes of these secretions or gastric juices. It is made up of acid, pepsinogen, mucus, enzymes, hormones. We also have intrinsic factor and gastropharin. Remember that intrinsic factor is needed for the intestinal absorption of vitamin B12. Gastropharin is going to help us with the absorption of iron in the small intestines. And you can tell that because of the term ferrin within the word gastropharin, meaning iron. The hormones are secreted into the blood and then it's gonna to travel to the tissues that it needs to target. The other secretions will then be released into the stomach lumen. These secretions are stimulated by eating. When we eat and put food into our GI tract, we have gastric distension. By the actions of the hormone gastrin and the paracrine pathways, so think histamine, ghrelin, somostatin, and by the effects of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, including ethanol, coffee, protein, the secretion of gastric juice is going to be influenced by numerous stimuli that in tandem together will facilitate digestion. And there are three phases of gastric secretion that promote enough acid by the stomach to break down our food. These phases start with the cephalic phase. It's stimulated by the thought, the smell, and the taste of food. Easy to remember because cephalic means head thought, smell, and taste. The gastric phase is going to be stimulated by the distension of our stomach. So when food enters our stomach, and the intestinal phase is going to be stimulated by histamine and the digestive protein in the fundus and the body of the stomach. The gastric glands of the mucosa are the primary secretory units. One more time, the gastric glands of the mucosa are the primary secretory units. What does the gastric juice content or composition really depend on? It depends on the volume and the flow rate. Potassium remains relatively constant throughout this process, but its concentration becomes greater in gastric juice than it does in plasma. And the rate of the secretion of potassium will vary during different times of the day, but generally, it's lowest in the morning and highest in the afternoon and the evening. Loss of these juices through vomiting, drainage, or even suctioning your patient can decrease the sodium and potassium stores, which then would result in a fluid and electrolyte imbalance. For instance, it would cause hyponatremia and hypokalemia. So if you are going to suction your patient or you notice that they are vomiting, or they're draining, then you would have to take a careful look at these electrolytes. You're also looking for signs of dehydration and acid-base imbalance. For instance, and more specifically, you're looking for metabolic alkalosis. Gastric secretion is inhibited by somatostatin. It's inhibited by somatostatin by unpleasant odors and taste, but also our gastric secretions can be inhibited in periods of rage, fear, and even pain. The sympathetic impulses can inhibit parasympathetic 
impulses. Increased secretions are associated with an aggression or hostility and may contribute to some forms of gastric pathology. So when we are in a period of stress or fear, we can actually be uh, affecting the health of our GI tract. Our acid is being secreted by parietal cells. And the major function of our gastric hydrochloric acid, to be specific, is to dissolve our food fibers. But it also can act as a bacterial site against microorganisms that we accidentally swallow. And what this means is it helps with the immunity and that function of our GI system. It also is responsible for converting pepsinogen to pepsin. The production of acid by our parietal cells does require hydrogen and chloride being transported from the parietal cells into the stomach lumen. It's formed in the parietal cells, this acid, primarily through hydrolysis of water. And at a high rate of gastric secretion, we also have bicarbonate moving into the plasma. We call this the alkaline tide. And this is when bicarbonate moves into the venous blood and it can result sometimes in having more alkaline urine as well. This acid secretion is stimulated by a nerve, the vagus nerve, and this releases acetylcholine and stimulates the secretion of gastrin, which then would stimulate the release of histamine from mast cells. Histamine will then stimulate acid secretion by activating a receptor called the histamine receptor. Sometimes we refer to this as the H2 receptor. So when our patients are taking H2 receptor blocker medication, what we're trying to do is block histamine from stimulating acid secretion. So what type of patients would you want to decrease acid secretion? Someone with a lot of stomach acid. So again, histamine stimulates acid secretion. So by using a H2 receptor blocker, we are blocking the histamine receptors. But we actually, in most cases, need histamine to stimulate acid secretion because we need this acid for digestion, and it does this by activating histamine receptors, H2 receptors. These receptors are on the acid-secreting parietal cells. What else could stimulate acid? Caffeine, calcium, and even ghrelin can stimulate acid secretion. What inhibits acid secretion? Somatostatin, secretin, and other intestinal hormones that we've talked about. Now we're moving on to pepsin. This is secreted by the chief cells. Acetylcholine, gastrin, secretin all stimulate the chief cells to release pepsinogen during eating. So without acid converting pepsinogen, we'd have nothing to convert to pepsin and then therefore nothing to be secreted by the chief cells. So it's all connected. Okay, so we have the release of pepsinogen during eating and then it's quickly converted to pepsin in the, uh, in the acidic gastric environment, so with the acid. The optimum pH for this activation to occur is two. So two is very acidic. Pepsin is a protolytic enzyme. What this means is that it's able to break down protein and form polypeptides. And this all occurs within the stomach. So once the chyme of food is entered into the duodenum, this alkaline environment of the duodenum will then inactivate the pepsin. We also have mucus that is stimulated by prostaglandins. This gastric mucosa in our GI tract is protected from the actions of acid and pepsin by intracellular tight junctions. We also have a coating of mucus called the mucosal barrier. Once this mucosal barrier breaks down, this is when we start to have problems because now acid and pepsin can go where they shouldn't go. We also have, to protect us, the gastric mucosal blood flow. Now prostaglandins protect the mucosal barrier 
because it's able to stimulate the secretion of mucus and bicarbonate, right? So mucus and bicarbonate are gonna to help to neutralize the secretion of acid. So if we have a break in the protective barrier, we might have ischemia, or we might put ourselves in um, a high risk environment being exposed to H. pylori, a bacteria. We also call this Helicobacter pylori. We might expose our uh, mucosal layer to aspirin and NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. What's the problem with exposing it to an NSAID? It will actually inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. It's also not good to expose it to ethanol or even regurgitated bile. So this breakdown of this protective barrier can cause many pathologies, including inflammation and ulceration. Well, with gastric motility, we finally find our food in the small intestines, which is coiled up in the peritoneal cavity. And if we uncoiled it, it would reach up to six meters long. Now it's divided into functional units or functional segments and there are three. We have the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum, all parts of the small intestines. The duodenum starts at the pylorus and then it ends where it's going to meet the jejunum. And this is at the suspensory ligament. This ligament is called the treats ligament. Now the end of the jejunum and the beginning of the ileum are not really distinguished by any type of anatomic marker, but we know that they are different because the jejunum has a larger lumen than the ileum. So it's really about how they look and the size. That's what tells us. The ileocecal valve or sphincter controls digestion from the ileum into the large intestines. So it helps with that flow of all the digestive material to move from that point of ileum to large intestines. But it also, because it's a sphincter, it's going to prevent any reflux or backflow into the small intestines. Again, ideally, we only want to go one directional. The duodenum lies behind the peritoneum, and we consider that to be in a retroperitoneal space. It's attached to the posterior abdominal wall. This peritoneum is a serous membrane, and it surrounds the organs of the abdomen and the pelvic cavity. Think about the pericardium around the heart and the pleura around the lungs. That's what it equivocates to. So the peritoneum is helping to surround the organs of the abdomen and pelvis. Now the visceral peritoneum, this lies on the surface of the organs, but then we also have the parietal peritoneum, which lines the walls of the actual body cavity. But then that means that there is some space between these two layers. This is the actual peritoneal cavity, and it contains just enough fluid so that there's lubrication between the two layers. This is going to help prevent friction. So as our organs are moving around, as they often do, we won't have friction between those two layers. Now the ileum and the jejunum are suspended in loose folds from the posterior or um, behind the abdominal wall by a peritoneal membrane, and this is called the mesentery. And it facilitates the intestinal motility, but it also, you'll find in this mesentery network, blood vessels, nerves, as well as lymphatics. Coming off a branch of the celiac artery, we have the gastroduodenal artery, and this is bringing the blood supply to the duodenum. The jejunum and ileum, these are going to be supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric vein will drain the blood from the entire small intestines, and then it empties into the hepatic portal circulation. Here you're also going to find regional lymph nodes and lymphatics, which will drain to the thoracic duct and then empty into the subclavian vein. 
Enteric nerves from both the autonomic nervous system will innervate the small intestines. Secretion, motility, pain, and intestinal reflexes are all going to be mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Specifically, here it is again, the vagus nerve. Now sympathetic activity will actually inhibit the motility. It also is gonna cause vasoconstriction. Intrinsic reflexive activity is what's mediated by what we call the Auerbach plexus or the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus, which is also called the Meissner plexus of the enteric nervous system. So there's two, the my myenteric and the submucosa that are mediated or that mediates the intrinsic reflexive activity. Now the smooth muscles of the small intestines, we have two layers. We have a longitudinal outer and a thicker inner circular layer. Those circular folds of the small intestines, this is what's going to actually regulate and slow the passage of food because it provides more time for digestion and absorption. So if things move too fast, you don't have time to pull in the nutrients that are needed uh, throughout the body. So the folds are going to help to slow it down so that we can get what we need. And they're most numerous, these folds, and more prominent in the jejunum and the proximal ileum. Now that we have the circular fold slowing down so that we can absorb, what is actually the functional unit that's doing the absorbing? It's actually the villi. So each villus is composed of absorptive columnar cells or enterocytes. And they also have mucus secreting goblet cells um, of the mucosal epithelium. So this is what's bringing in absorption of nutrients. And each of these villus secretes some of the enzymes that are necessary for digestion and absorbs the nutrients. Now near the surface, these columnar cells are closely adhering to one another at tight junctions but water and electrolytes are absorbed through intercellular spaces. And the surface of each of these columnar epithelial cells on the villus are gonna contain little projections, we call them microvilli, or singular, they'd be called microvillus. Together, the microvilli and the mucosal surface will create a brush border. This is where so the villi and the microvilli, this is where they're going to absorb and it increases the surface area because of all these little projections. We also have the coating of the brush border. And this is where we have a layer of water that is important for absorption and, and it helps with the water soluble substances. The lamina purpurea, this is a connective tissue layer of the mucous membrane and it lies between the epithelial cells of the villi and it contains lymphocytes, plasma cells, and it produces aminoglobulins for our immune system. In terms of blood supply, we have central arterioles that ascend within each of these villus and then they branch into the capillary area that extends around the base of the columnar cells and then it moves down to the venules that then will ultimately again lead to the hepatic portal circulation. The contents of the lacteals, which are lymphatic capillaries, flow to regional nodes and channels that eventually will drain into the thoracic duct. So not only do we have blood flowing through here, but we also have lymph. Now there is a term that is often discussed in many pathophysiology questions, and that's the crypts of Leberkuhn. Do you perhaps remember what the crypts of Leberkuhn are um, important for? Between the bases of the villi and the crypts of Leberkuhn, which extend into the submucosal layer, we have undifferentiated cells that arise from the stem cells at the base of the crypt and they move toward the tip of the villus 
as they mature, they become columnar epithelial secretory cells, meaning that they're going to help secrete water, electrolytes, and enzymes. We also have goblet cells, which produce mucus. But after completing that movement or migration to the tip of the villus, they function for only a few days. And eventually they're gonna shed into the intestinal lumen and then become part of what is digested. What do we do with this? Well, these epithelial cells need to be discarded and they're an important source of endogenous protein. Well, how often does this get replaced? Every four to seven days, the entire epithelial population can be replaced. But there's many factors that influence this process. We have starvation, vitamin B12 deficiency, cytotoxic drugs, irradiation. These are all gonna suppress our cell division, which will then shorten the lifespan of the villi, as well as the villi themselves. This decreased absorption across the epithelial membrane will then cause diarrhea and malnutrition because things are moving too fast and this is what occurs with diarrhea or we don't have anything to absorb the nutrients as they're passing through. Can you describe the process of digestion? Digestion is initiated in the stomach by our gastric hydrochloric acid and our pepsin. So the chyme or the food passes into the duodenum it's liquid at this point with small particles of undigested food. And then the digestion of food components will continue into the proximal portion of the small intestines by pancreatic enzymes, by intestinal enzymes, and by bile salts. Now in the proximal small intestines, our carbs, our carbohydrates are gonna be broken down. They break down into monosaccharides and disaccharides. Our proteins will then start to be degraded into amino acids and peptides, and then our fats will be emulsified. They get reduced to fatty acids and monoglycerides. Now, these nutrients, along with water, vitamins, and electrolytes, they all can be absorbed across intestinal mucosa by active transport, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and what's left of carbohydrates and protein breakdown well, they're gonna move into the villus capillaries and then to the liver through the hepatic portal vein. Remembering that most of this all filters back into the hepatic portal system. Digestive fats move into the lacteals, they reach the liver through the portal and systemic circulation, and then they're metabolized by the liver. Intestinal motility exposes nutrients to a large mucosal surface area. How does it do this? It mixes chyme, it moves it through the lumen. Remembering that we have different segments of the GI tract that absorb different nutrients. They all have a job and a function. The major nutrients are going to be um, digested in the small intestines, as well as many drugs. Both the absorption and the digestion of these major nutrients. But also, you can see that as it moves through, you have areas where sodium and potassium exchange takes place. And this is going to be at the large intestines. And finally, as water gets removed out of the colon, and also we have regulation of acid-base balance, what's left of this digestive food starts to move down the large intestines out of the body as feces. Well, what really facilitates intestinal motility? The movement of the small intestine will facilitate digestion and absorption. So the chyme leaves the stomach, it enters the duodenum, which stimulates intestinal movement that helps to blend the secretions from the liver, because now the liver is helping out, they're accessory to our um, intestines and so we need these liver secretions then our gallbladder adds bile our pancreas adds pancreatic enzymes and then we have the intestinal glands they're all going to help break down food and then we have this churning motion which then will bring the luminal contents into contact with the villi right and then the villi absorb what we need this movement 
will then advance the chyme toward the large intestines. Our intestinal motility is affected by two different movements. We have segmentation, which is localized contractions, very rhythmic, and the contractions are occurring at the circular smooth muscle layer. It's mixing and dividing chyme, and then it's also allowing the digestive enzymes to have contact with the chyme, and it absorbs what it needs to in the mucosal surface. When it's done doing its job, it's gonna propel it toward the large intestines. In addition to segmentation, we have peristalsis. Again, we know these are the waves of contraction along the short segments of longitudinal smooth muscle. And this is going to allow time for digestion and absorption to actually occur. The villi move with contractions of the muscularis mucosa, which is a very thin layer of muscle that separates the mucosa and the submucosa. With absorption, it's going to promote absorption by swaying this villi, moving it around into the luminal contents. And as it's moving around and around during peristalsis, it's trying to grab on to nutrients to absorb. We also have neural reflexes that facilitate our motility, our digestion, as well as our absorption. The iliogastric reflex will inhibit gastric motility when the ileum becomes too distended. And it's good that we have this mechanism so that it knows when it needs to stop the movement. It's going to prevent this continued movement because there's already too much stuff into the intestines. It's distended. This reflex inhibits intestinal motility when one part of the intestines is too over distended. But both of the reflexes require extrinsic innervation. The gastroileal reflex is activated by an increase in gastric motility and secretion. It stimulates an increase in ileal motility and the relaxation of the ileocecal valve. We need this because it's going to empty the ileum and prepare it to receive more chyme. But first, we've got to empty the ileum. We're making room. The gastroileal reflex is probably regulated by hormones like gastrin and cholecystokinin. Well, what happens when you are fasting or you're in between meals or maybe particularly asleep at night? The slow waves sweep along the entire length of the, the intestinal tract from the stomach all the way to the terminal ileum. This is called interdigestive myoelectric movement. This interdigestive myoelectric complex appears to propel residual gastric and intestinal contents into the colon. So even when there's not much in there, things are still moving around. The sphincter, the ileocecal valve, is going to be the anatomical landmark or junction between the terminal ileum and the large intestines. So this valve is regulated intrinsically and usually it's closed. But when we have this peristaltic wave from the last few centimeters of the ileum, it's going to actually cause this ileocecal valve to open. Good thing, because we need chyme to pass. The distension of the upper large intestine will then cause the sphincter to constrict, which will say no more distension and absolutely no retrograde flow. We don't want to move it backwards, especially once it gets past the ileocecal valve. We're in the large intestines now, which is approximately 1.5 meters long, and we have the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. Those make up the large intestines. The cecum is a pouch that will help to get the chyme or receive the chyme from the ileum. Attached to it, we have the appendix, the vermiform appendix to be exact. And this has arguably limited physiologic function, but there have been some recent studies that show that it may have a protective role in gut immunity. So once it's in the cecum or the pouch, the chyme is going to enter then the colon, which loops around. So we have the transverse going through the abdominal cavity, and then we have the, it descending to the anal canal, so that's the descending, 
and the four parts of the colon are ascending, transverse, descending, and then as it descends down, we get to the sigmoid colon. There's two sphincters that control the intestinal contents and how they flow through the cecum and the colon. We have the ileocecal valve, which emits chyme from the ileum to the cecum. That's its job there. Remember, we don't want it to go back, so if that ileocecal valve doesn't work, um, we're in big trouble. But we also have the rectosigmoid canal, which controls the movement of waste from the sigmoid colon into the rectum. This also needs to work. All these sphincters cause big problems if they don't work effectively. So this smooth muscle surrounds the anal canal. It forms the internal anal sphincter. It's pretty thick, about two and a half to three centimeters. It also has an overlapping of striated skeletal muscle of the external anal sphincter or the anus. And you see that down here. In the cecum and the colon, we have longitudinal muscle layers, which we have um, these three bands. They're called tenae coli, and these are longitudinal bands. And they're shorter than the colon, and they look kind of bunched up and gathered together. The circular muscles of the colon separate into outpouching, and we call these haustra. The haustra become more and less prominent when there are contractions and relaxations of the circular muscles. Depends on whether it's being contracted or whether it's being relaxed. And we also have the mucosal surface of the colon, which has rugae as well. Remember, rugae just means folds. And particularly between the holstra and the crypts of Libercun, but not um, Vila. Columnar epithelial cells and mucus secreting goblet cells from muc uh, mucosa throughout the large intestines are going to be present as well. Remember, goblet cells help with secretion of mucus. And then we have the columnar epithelial, which will absorb fluid and electrolytes, and mucus secreting cells will lubricate the mucosa in that area. In the large intestines, we have extrinsic parasympathetic innervation. Again, it's through the vagus nerve. Vagal stimulation increases rhythmic contraction of the colon from the cecum to the first part of the transverse colon. These fibers, vagal fibers, will reach the distal colon through the sacral and the parasympathetic splenic nerves. The internal anal sphincter is then contracted and the response, which is reflexive, will then relax when the rectum is distended. The intrinsic myenteric plexus provides the major innervation that's needed of the internal anal sphincter. However, it can respond to sympathetic stimulation to maintain contraction and parasympathetic stimulation to facilitate relaxation, depending on what it needs. We need a relaxation when the rectum is full. Sympathetic innervation of this sphincter arises from celiac and supermesenteric ganglia and the sphincter nerves. What innervates this area? The external anal sphincter is innervated by the pudinal nerve, which arises from the sacral areas of the spinal cord. Sympathetic activity and then entire large intestines will then modulate these reflexes. This modulation is going to tell it that there is some somatic sensation of fullness and pain. Once you feel this, it's going to participate in the defecation reflex. It's going to constrict blood vessels. The supply of blood of the large intestines in the rectum primarily is derived from the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries and it drains through the inferior mesenteric vein. Colonic movement is segmental. The circular muscles will contract and relax at different sites. Then they move the intestinal contents back and forth between the hostra, especially during fasting. And the movements will then start to massage what's in the intestines through and down 
and this is called the fecal pass at this point. It facilitates the absorption of water. Then we have propulsive movements with the proximal to distal contractions of the hostile units. And then this peristaltic movement will occur promoting the emptying of the colon. This gastrocolic reflex initiates propulsion in the entire colon. And usually this is happening right after eating. It happens pretty immediately. So whenever someone says like they gotta go make room or you're eating and suddenly you need to go to the bathroom, it's the gastrocolic reflex that's been initiated. And this occurs when chyme enters into the ileum. The gastrocolic reflex causes fecal mass to pass rapidly into the sigmoid colon and the rectum, and it stimulates defecation. Gastrin also participates in this reflex as well. Epinephrine will inhibit the contractile activity. Exogenous opioids also will inhibit this activity. And this is why a lot of our pain medications that are opioid derivatives will cause constipation because it will inhibit this gastrocolic reflex. We're gonna move on and talk about immunity in relationship to our GI system. Let's talk about gut-associated lymphoid tissue, sometimes referred to as GALT, and it plays a major role in our immune defenses. Because it has the ability to kill many pathogenic microorganisms, and it also prevents any reaction to foreign proteins that we might have ingested. The mucosa of the intestines covers the large surface area and it secretes antibodies like IgA. But also we have enzymes that provide this defense against microorganisms. Think about the small intestines. We have panic cells located near the base of the crypts of Leberkuhn. These produce defensins and other antimicrobial peptides and lysozymes that will help with mucosal immunity. Our small intestines have pyre patches, and these are lymph nodules that contain a collection of lymphocytes, also plasma cells and macrophages, remember all connected to our immune system, and they're most numerous in the ileum and they produce antimicrobial peptides, but they also have IgA. Now, pyre patches are important because the antigen processing that occurs there and the immune defense that it provides. Our intestinal microbiome is quite wonderful. The type and the number of our bacterial flora is going to vary really greatly from one individual to the next. And they're increasing in the number of bacteria from the proximal to the distal GI tract. And so as we move towards the colon, we have the highest concentration of bacteria. What affects the normal composition of our bacterial flora? We have genetics, diet, our environment, pollution, personal hygiene, drugs like antibiotics, maybe vaccinations, infections, radiation, these are all going to affect the normal composition of bacterial flora. The intestinal bacteria don't have major digestive or absorption functions, but they do play a role in the metabolism of bile, bile salts. They play a role in estrogens and androgens, lipids, carbs, and also nitrogenous substances and drugs. They produce antimicrobial peptides, hormones, neurotransmitters, anti-inflammatory metabolites and vitamins. They can destroy toxins, they prevent pathogen colonization, and they also alert the immune system as a whole, protecting against infection. We need our intestinal microbiome overall to help us with our health. When we have an altered or translocation of our microbiome, if it's altered, we call this dysbiosis, it can really start to cause disease and decrease our health. The intestinal tract is sterile when we're born, but really quickly it starts to become colonized. It only takes a few hours. By the time the infant reaches four weeks old, 
the normal flora has already been established. And this diversity in the number of bacteria will decrease with aging, which will then increase the risk for infection. Normal flora does not have the virulence factors that are associated with the pathogenic microorganisms. What this means is it can permit immune tolerances. Bacteria in the stomach, it's relatively sparse because of the secretion of acid. Because this acidic environment is not hospitable to bacteria. It's going to kill the ingested pathogens and inhibit bacterial growth, except for one. If you guess H. pylori, you're correct. Bile acid secretion, intestinal motility, and antibody production suppress bacterial growth in the duodenum. In the duodenum and the jejunum, there's very low concentrations of aerobes like streptococci, lactobacilli, staphylococci, and other enteric bacteria. But anaerobes can be found distal to the ileocecal valve, but they don't exist proximal to the ileum. Anaerobes constitute about 95% of our fecal flora in the colon, and it contributes to one third of our bulk of feces. Bacteria roads like gram negative and what we call gram positive firmicutes are the most common colon bacteria. Our visceral blood flow, sometimes referred to as our splanchnic blood flow, provides blood to the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, but also to the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, and the spleen. It flows with regulation by cardiac output, blood volume, and the autonomic nervous system. It also is controlled by hormones and our local autoregulatory blood flow mechanisms. The GI circulation really serves as an important reservoir of blood volume, which will then maintain circulation to the heart and to the lungs when it's needed. Now we're finally going to discuss the accessory organs of digestion, which are commonly referred to as accessory organs. They really do play major parts. The liver, the gallbladder, and exocrine pancreas all secrete substances that are necessary for digestion. They are delivered to the duodenum through the sphincter of Odi. And this is at the major duodenal papilla or the vader. The liver produces bile, which contains salt, so sometimes we just call it bile salts, that are necessary for the digestion of fat and the absorption. So in between eating, bile is stored into the gallbladder. When it's needed, it gets secreted. The exocrine pancreas produces enzymes that we need to complete the digestive process of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, but also an alkaline fluid that neutralizes chyme that creates a pH in the duodenum that supports enzymatic actions. The liver also receives nutrients that are absorbed by the small intestines and it metabolizes or it's gonna synthesize them into things that can be absorbed by the body cells. So in the forms that are necessary for absorption and it can release the nutrients into the bloodstream or it can choose to store them for later. First, we'll talk about the liver, which weighs 1,200 to 1,600 grams. It's pretty big, and it's located under the right diaphragm, and it's divided into the right and the left lobes. Now, the larger lobe is the right. It can even be divided further into the caudate liver and the quadrate liver lobes. The falciform ligament separates the right and the left lobes. It attaches to the anterior abdominal wall, and the round ligament extends along the free edge of the falciform ligament. And this is going to extend to the umbilicus and the inferior surface of the liver. Then we have the coronary ligament, which branches from the falciform ligament, and it's gonna extend over the superior surface of the right and left lobes. It binds the liver to the inferior surface of the diaphragm, keeps it in place. And it's covered, the liver, by the glisten capsule. 
This contains blood vessels, lymphatics, and also nerves. And when the liver is diseased or swollen, you might see distension of this capsule. And this is what's causing the pain because the capsule is innervated by sensory neurons. Let's talk about the metabolic functions of the liver. In order for the metabolic functions to work properly, it's gonna require a large amount of blood. And the liver does receive blood from both the arterial and the venous sources. So we have the hepatic artery, which merges at the superior mesenteric and the splenic veins. So this is when we start to call it the hepatic artery. And then it receives blood from the inferior mesenteric, gastric, and cystic veins. This is gonna provide arterial oxygenated blood. And it's really quite fast, 400 to 500 milliliters every minute, or about five to 7% of cardiac output. The hepatic portal vein will then receive the deoxygenated blood, because remember we're in the venous system now, from the inferior and superior mesenteric veins, the splenic vein, and the gastric and esophageal veins. And this is occurring at a thousand to 1500 milliliters per minute. The hepatic portal vein will carry 70% of the blood to the liver. This blood is going to be rich in nutrients and it can be absorbed from the intestinal tract. Now we're going to detail the architecture of the liver by looking at the liver lobes. And these are about 100,000 tiny anatomic units called liver lobules. And they're formed of cords, or sometimes called plates, of hepatocytes, which are the functional cells of the liver. Hepatocytes can regenerate. So if there's any damage or resected liver tissue, it can actually regrow. There are small capillaries or sinusoids located between each of these plates, and they can receive a mixture of venous and arterial blood from branches of the hepatic artery and the portal vein. Now blood from the sinusoids will then drain into the central vein in the middle of each liver lobule and the venous blood from all the lobules will then flow back into the hepatic vein, emptying into the inferior vena cava. The sinusoids of the liver lobules are lined with highly permeable endothelium, and this permeability is important because it's gonna enhance the transport of nutrients from the sinusoids into each of the hepatocytes, and this is where they are metabolized. We also have an immune function occurring in the liver as well. And this includes the sinusoidal endothelial cells, but also the Kupfer cells, stellate, and natural killer cells. They all contribute to the immune function. The sinusoidal cells line these capillaries, and additionally, they have a barrier function, which helps with immune function. It will help with endocytosis, antigen presentation, and also leukocyte recruitment. The sinusoids, these are lined with Kupfer cells, which are phagocytic cells. They're tissue macrophages, and they're part of the mononuclear phagocytic system. The Kupfer cells are important because Kupfer cells are needed for healing injury to the liver. It can regenerate only with the help of Kupfer cells. They are also bactericidal, and they're important for bilirubin production and lipid metabolism. Now, stellate cells, they contain retinoids like vitamin A, and they are contractile in liver injury. This contraction helps to regulate sinusoidal blood flow, and also they can proliferate into myofibroblasts. This is going to help also in liver fibrosis, which will produce um, enough movement to help with proliferation. It produces erythropoietin. It can also act as an antigen presenting cell. It removes foreign substances from the blood. It traps bacteria. It really does quite a bit. Now, the natural killer cells, sometimes we call them the pit cells, they're found in the sinusoidal lumen and they produce interferon Y. 
and they're important in tumor defense. Between the endothelial lining of the sinusoid and the hepatocyte, we call this the desist space. This drains the interstitial fluid into the hepatic lymph system. So let's practice now. We have our first question, which of the following found in liver sinusoids are important for healing the liver injury and are bactericidal? If you remember that it's the Kupfer cells, you're correct. If not, go back one slide and read the descriptions again. The Kupfer cells are tissue macrophages that line the sinusoids. They're part of that mononuclear phagocytic system and they help with healing the liver but they're also bactericidal. Remember, they also help with bilirubin production and lipid metabolism. They do quite a bit. Our liver helps by secreting 700 to 1200 milliliters of bile every single day. Now bile is alkaline, it's bitter tasting. Have you ever tasted bile as it regurgitates up the esophagus? It's also yellow or green fluid containing bile salts or conjugated bile acids. Additionally, it contains cholesterol, bilirubin, which is a pigment, electrolytes, and water. Bile is formed by hepatocytes, and then it's secreted into, into this area called the bile caniculi. Bile caniculi are small channels that will help to move bile outward to the bile ducts and then drain eventually into the common bile duct. Once this duct empties the bile into the ampulla of Vader, it's going to move into the duodenum through the major duodenal papillae or the sphincter of Bodhi. These bile salts are needed for intestinal emulsification of fat and also the absorption of fat, including fat soluble vitamins. Now, having facilitated fat emulsification and absorption, most of these salts are actively absorbed in the terminal ileum and then returned to the liver through the portal circulation because they can be recycled and resecreted. The pathway for recycling of bile salts is termed the enterohepatic circulation. So this is something that we want to have and it keeps everything moving along and flowing along nicely. Here you can see the enterohepatic circulation in action. So the hepatocytes synthesize cholesterol, which will then form the primary bile salts, or excuse me, acids, which happen in the liver. Now these pool together, so we have amino acids conjugating the bile acids to form the bile salt. Now that we have the bile, it's going to move into the gallbladder where it can be stored and then release when we eat, or it can move directly to the duodenum and the jejunum. These salts emulsify fat and they will help with fat absorption. They also form micelles to transport these fats into other layers. These micelles will release the fat at the brush border. The free bile salts will then move through the intestinal lumen into either the rectum or back into the ileum colon. So if it goes through the rectum, then it's excreted into the feces and about 15 to 35% of our bile salts will end up in our feces. However, if it moves back to the ileum and colon, it can be deconjugated by bacteria into secondary bile acids. Then they will diffuse passively across the lumen and then move back into the hepatic portal vein circulation. 65 to 85% of bile salts actually take on this secondary role and they enter the circulation with protein binding and they're transported back into the liver to be recycled and then redistributed into our bile. We're dissecting bile even further into two fractional components. We have the acid dependent and we also have the acid independent fraction. Hepatocytes secrete bile acid dependent fraction. And this consists of bile acids, cholesterol, like phospholipids, lectin, and bilirubin. The bile acid independent fraction, which is secreted by the hepatocytes and epithelial cells of the bile, caniculi, is a bicarbonate-rich aqueous fluid 
that gives its alkaline pH. It facilitates the buffering of chyme entering into the duodenum from the stomach. Bilirubin is a byproduct of our old worn out RBCs, our red blood cells. Once these get destructed after approximately 120 days, it becomes bilirubin and it gives bile a greenish black color and produces the yellow tinge of jaundice that we see. Aged red blood cells are then absorbed and destroyed by our macrophages like our kupfer cells. And this occurs within the mononuclear phagocytic system. This happens primarily in the spleen and in the liver. Within these cells, we have hemoglobin separated into heme and globin. The globin component is further then degraded into amino acids, which go into the amino acid pool to form new proteins. The heme is converted to biliverdin by the enzymatic cleavage of iron and this iron attaches to transferrin in the plasma and it, then it's stored in the liver or it can be used in the bone marrow to make new RBCs. So there is a component of recyclation there too. The biliverdin is enzymatically converted to bilirubin in the Cooper cell and it's released into the plasma where it binds to albumin and is known as unconjugated bilirubin or free bilirubin, which is lipid soluble. Bilirubin also has a role as an antioxidant and it provides cytoprotection as well. And you can see with the schematic how it's being degraded down through the plasma, back to the hepatocytes, through the bile channels, intestines, the liver, and then through the kidneys, excreted through feces or urine. The liver works really hard and it also has vascular and hematologic functions as well. Because of the extensive vascular network, it can store large volumes of blood. And when we need this in times of maybe low blood circulation, like an event of a hemorrhage, the liver can release blood to help maintain systemic circulation. It also has hemostatic functions. It synthesizes most of our clotting factors. Vitamin K, which is a fat soluble vitamin, is essential for the synthesis of these vitamin, or excuse me, of these clotting factors. And because our bile salts are needed for reabsorption of fats, vitamin K absorption depends on adequate bile production in the liver. It's all interconnected. Carbohydrates are actually a function of the liver as well. We have the metabolism of carbs, but also proteins and fat. And it does contribute to the stability of our blood glucose levels. It does this by releasing glucose when we are in a low blood glucose state or when we're hypoglycemic. It realizes this and it can release our glucose. It also absorbs glucose during hyperglycemic states. So when our blood glucose is really high. Additionally, it can store glucose as glycogen in glycogenesis and it can convert it to fat when needed. When all our glycogen stores have been used, the liver can actually convert amino acids and glycerol to glucose. This is called gluconeogenesis, all happening within the liver. The gallbladder, which lies on the inferior surface of the liver, is primarily there to help store and concentrate our bile in between eating. And it can actually hold up to 90 milliliters of bile and it gets stimulated about 30 minutes after we eat under the influence of the vagus nerve and our cholecystokinin. Now, during the interdigestive period, our bile is going to flow from the liver through the right or the left hepatic duct, move into the common hepatic duct, and it meets resistance at the sphincter foci, which is closed at this point. It controls the flow into the duodenum, and it's going to prevent the backflow of duodenal contacts. 
bile then will then move to the cystic duct into the gallbladder where it's going to be concentrated and stored until we need it or if it doesn't choose the gallbladder it continues on and gets recirculated the mucosa of the gallbladder readily absorbs water and electrolytes so it leaves a high concentration of bile salts and pigments and cholesterol but 30 minutes after we eat the sphincter knows that it needs to relax so that bile can flow into the duodenum and during the cephalic and gastric phases of digestion the gallbladder will then contract and we also have hormonal regulation that is derived from the cholecystokinin that's secreted by the duodenal and jejunal mucosa. This happens in the presence of fat. We have vasoactive intestinal peptide, pancreatic polypeptide, and sympathetic nerve stimulation, which relaxes the gallbladder. The pancreas is an organ that's approximately 20 centimeters long, and it has its head tucked in the curve of the duodenum, and its tail touches the spleen and it lies deep in the abdomen behind the stomach. It's a pretty unique organ because not only does it have an exocrine function related to digestion, but it also has an endocrine function. And you'll learn more about that or remember that in the endocrine lecture, but its endocrine function is to secrete hormones like insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, and pancreatic polypeptides from the pancreatic islets. We're gonna focus now though on the exocrine pancreas. It's composed of acenar cells that secrete enzymes and the networks of ducts that secrete our alkaline fluids. And they both have an important digestive functions. We need the acenar cells because they are going to help with the secretion. And the acenar cells are organized into spherical lobules called the acenae. And they're all around these small secretory ducts. These drains into a system of ducts that lead to the pancreatic duct, or we call this the Wurzung duct. And it empties into the common bile duct at the ample elevator and into the duodenum. But for some people, we have an accessory duct called the Santorini, and it branches off the pancreatic duct and it drains directly into the duodenum of the minor duodenal papilla. Arterial blood supply is going to branch off the celiac and superior mesenteric arteries and the venous blood is going to leave and move towards the portal vein through the splenic vein. Our exocrine pancreas also secretes aqueous and enzymatic components of pancreatic juices and this is all controlled by hormonal and vagal stimuli. First we have secretin which is going to stimulate the senar and duct cells to secrete bicarbonate rich fluid which will eventually neutralize the chyme and prepare it for digestion. Remember, as chyme enters the duodenum, it has an acidity that will stimulate the secretin producing cells or S cells. The pH level is at a 4.5 or less. Now, as it gets to the release of secretin, it's going to be absorbed by the intestines and delivered to the pancreas in the bloodstream. In the pancreas, secretin causes ductal and acenar cells to then release alkaline fluid and it inhibits the actions of gastrin, thereby decreasing gastric, hydrochloric acid, secretion, and motility. So in addition to releasing alkaline fluid, it's gonna stop acid as well. So the net effect is going to be the neutralization of the contents of the duodenum. We also have enzymatic secretion stimulated by cholecystokinin that follows. And this activates acetylcholine from the vagus nerve and it releases this acetylcholine from pancreatic stellate cells as well. The cholecystokinin, then released into the duodenum, will be in response to amino acids and fatty acids that are already present within the chyme. And once this is in the small intestines, it's going to be activated by the pancreatic enzymes, which will inhibit the release of more cholecystokinin and acetylcholine. So it's moving on a feedback loop. This feedback mechanism will inhibit the secretion of more pancreatic enzymes. It already knows it has enough. The pancreatic polypeptide is released after eating and it's gonna inhibit any postprandial pancreatic exocrine secretion. Postprandial meaning after we eat. Our pancreatic enzymes hydrolyze proteins, carbs, and fats. 
the proteases, amylases, and lipases. The protolytic enzymes include trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, and elastase. And these enzymes are secreted in inactive forms. So we have trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase, proelastasase, respectively. And it's protecting the pancreas from digestive effects of its own enzymes. So it doesn't auto-digest itself. So for further protection, the pancreas produces a trypsin inhibitor, which will then prevent the activation of protolytic enzymes while they're in the pancreas. But once the duodenum captures these pancreatic juices, it starts to be activated. And it's activated by enterokinase, which is an enzyme secreted by the duodenal mucosa. Trypsinogen is the first proenzyme to be activated, and it converts to trypsin, which stimulates the conversion of uh, chymotrypsinogen to chymotrypsin, and also procarboxypeptase to carboxypeptidase. So each of these enzymes will then cleave specific to the peptide that it needs to bind to, and it's going to reduce polypeptides to smaller peptides. So basically, the trypsin inhibitor, while it's in the pancreas, will make sure that it doesn't activate and destroy itself. Now let's check our learning. Do you remember which organ bile is produced by? If you picked A, you're right. Bile is produced by the liver. The pancreas produces pancreatic enzymes. The small intestines definitely doesn't produce bile. And gallbladder doesn't produce bile, but it can store bile between periods of eating. And when we need it to go into the duodenum, it can move bile into the duodenum for digestion. So the answer here is A.